On behalf of the co-organizers, it is my honor to welcome you to this launch of the 2023 UNFPA State of the World Population Report here in Sweden. It is a launch that we will mark with an in-depth discussion on the sexual and reproductive rights of young African women. My name is Therese Schumande Magnusson and I'm the director of the Nordic Africa Institute. We're here today broadcasting from our library here in Uppsala in Sweden. For the past 60 years, we have together with our partners contributed to a deeper understanding of contemporary African perspectives. Through the lens of social sciences, we capture people's lived experiences in order to explain the underlying dynamics of societies. During the COVID-19 pandemic, UNESCO estimated that about 15 million children in sub-Saharan Africa were kept out of school. In preparing for the reopening of schools in Uganda, the National Planning Authority estimated that as much as 30% of all pre-COVID school-going children may not return to various, for various reasons, including teenage pregnancy and early marriage. I think we're all in agreement that the consequences of unwanted teenage pregnancies is a failure of every society. As the UNFPA Global Report says, we must guarantee the ability to make reproductive and sexual health decisions free from discrimination, coercion and violence. Through the conversation we will be having here today with leading specialists, experts and scientists in the field of sexual and reproductive rights, we want to inspire new thinking, but also create a platform for mutual learning between research, policy and practice. And I'm particularly proud that the perspectives of young women in Uganda will be a starting point for our panel discussion. But now, it is my honor to invite the Executive Director of the United Nations Population Fund, Dr. Natalia Kanem. Dr. Kanem will deliver a keynote speech and formally launch the 2023 UNFPA State of the World Population Report. Dr. Kanem, please, the floor is yours. Thanks very much, Dr. Director General, Director Magnuson, dear friends, dear colleagues, dear young people, world population is radically reorganizing itself. In November, the human family surpassed 8 billion people. That's the largest population that the world has ever known. And at the same time, the global fertility rate is the lowest in living memory. We're living in a period of dynamic, extreme diversity, when it comes to demographics of population, two thirds of people now live in places where there has been a decline in fertility below replacement, meaning less than 2.1, if you will, children per woman, while others live in countries experiencing a vigorous population growth. And at this moment, some countries have a, an average median age of 50, while others have a median age of 15. Interesting times. Today, I will be presenting UNFPA's 2023 State of World Population Report. It's titled, Eight Billion Lives, Infinite Possibilities. It makes the case for rights and choices. And that's why I'm really happy to be here. I would like to Thank, in particular, the Nordic Africa Institute. It's my first time here in Uppsala. Beautiful day to be here. And it's also interesting to reflect, I'm told this is the oldest university in uh, Sweden. Moreover, this house, the Nordic Africa Institute, is a repository 
not only of statistics and facts, but the stories of what binds people together in international solidarity. So very happy to be here on behalf of UNFPA. And I would also like to recognize and thank RFSU and the Swedish Ministry for Foreign Affairs. A special welcome, of course, to all of you who are here as well as online. The ranking of the world's population is undergoing significant changes. And by the year 2050, Africa, the one region which continues to be characterized by high population growth, will feature five out of the eight countries that will account for the rapid population growth that we're going to see. So when we think of that list, India, which now has overtaken China as the most populous country on earth, Pakistan, Egypt, Democratic Republic of Congo, Ethiopia, Nigeria, the Philippines, and Tanzania, five of those eight most rapidly growing through 2050 will be on the African continent. And it's also true that the population of Africa itself will double by that time, the year 2050, and one quarter of the world's population will by that moment hail from the continent. Big shifts. And if these projections hold true, Africa will displace both Central and Southern Asia and Eastern and Southeast Asia as the most populous region in the world by the end of the century, the year 2100. Remarkable that as we see young population, we also see the largest number of older people over the age of 60, again, than ever before in history. This tells a remarkable story of decline in mortality. It's also true that in Africa, since the end of colonialism, with improved health and well being on the continent, fertility rates there are declining, albeit at a slower rate than elsewhere in the world, right? And let me say this the East and Southern Africa region accounts for the largest share of the global burden of HIV among young people. Much progress has been made in the HIV and sexual and reproductive health and rights fields. However, adolescents and young people continue to be left behind and the African adolescent girl is the only cohort where HIV is actually rising. So this tells us that the virus is not just the virus under the microscope. We also have to look at societal relations which lead to making such a young girl vulnerable. The high population growth rates in Africa underscore that there are indeed many societal as well as individual advantages to being able to decide on how many children you want. And typically that does lead to fewer children per family because we see the highest fertility rates as in Niger, where now the average uh, woman, the average number of children per woman is 6.97, meaning 14 versus zero to one, right? High fertility rates are indeed correlated with lower female life expectancy, with higher rates of unintended pregnancy, and higher death rates for mothers, for newborns, for children under the age of five. The report demonstrates that many African countries could indeed re realize what we term a demographic dividend, which would be reducing the dependency ratio. And many of us know that one salary, one paycheck, one income has to be stretched over so many people in the family and the extended family. So by reducing the dependency ratio, by increasing women's participation in the labor force and allowing for increased investments in human and physical capital, that's the demographic dividend that can really be catalytic in helping African countries to prosper. And this is a paradigm that has been known for decades in the so-called Asian 
tigers enjoyed, where the economy is bolstered and contraception and rights and choices are available to women, they make choices that are commensurate with their understanding about well being. So these dynamics are really interesting, I think, not just for the demographers or for the people who work on census and population in our group, but for all of us who are concerned about human rights, human dignity, and particularly reproductive rights at a time when this is a politically charged discussion. Everyone has an opinion, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're asking women who are the holders of this right, what is your opinion? So in some places already, we're seeing reproductive rights undermined based on these population discussions. What's already happening in some places is that there are calls to ban contraception in public hospitals in countries that are worried about low fertility and quote unquote, want women to up the amount of children that they have. In other places, there are calls for limiting family size two for you, one and a half for you, three for you. Now, women in some places are being urged to step away from their careers for the good of the nation. But at the same time, uh, women are also standing up and insisting that they're not merely the womb. They're not merely a factory of babies. The report in essence has two very clear messages. The first one is let us shatter the myths about population. And this is interesting for audiences who are concerned about development in Africa. We looked at the prevailing impressions that people have about the state of world population. And many say that the world is overpopulated, that 8 billion, oh my goodness, it's too many. They blame fertility rates for the climate crisis, for instance, erroneously. In a recent survey, we found that the most commonly held view is that the global population is too large, fertility rates are too high, and according to that kind of logic, global warming is supposedly driven by the proliferation of human beings on the planet, and there are finite resources, not enough to go around. We're back to Malthus. This fallacy holds the wrong people to account. What is true? is that it is only 10% of the world's population that accounts for half of the greenhouse gas emissions that lead to uh, climate change. When we speak about countries with high fertility rates, they contribute the least to global warming, and yet they suffer the most from the consequences, right? Because the impact on a woman in the Sahel, for example, I mentioned Niger with the seven children. What impact can she likely have on greenhouse gas emissions without a car, very often without electricity, et cetera, et cetera. But she and her community are experiencing some of the biggest damage from the rising temperatures in this world. So when we focus on fertility rates, it distracts us from looking for solutions like for example, reducing consumption in the wealthy countries, which actually would lead to a uh, faster impact. Similarly, we try in this report to shatter the myth that low birth rates are the culprit in societies where fertility is low and aging becomes an issue because there's the dependency right there it means there are not enough younger people working to support the pension plan and the social security, et cetera. Again, blaming women for this, for producing an insufficient supply of babies is really ignoring the much more viable solutions that we would look at if we attended to the type of solutions that would respect human rights. For example, agingly, uh, aging low fertility countries could increase productivity by things like gender parity in the workforce and in the home, and by expanding access to affordable childcare, by having paternal, sorry, parental leave rather than assigning maternity leave. I mean, it's a two, it's a it's a process where the couple shares in the responsibility. And again, in a world where it's difficult to talk about migration, this is a very high-level solution to workforces that are aging. 
And we actually invited IOM, the Office of Migration of the United Nations for the first time to share with us an essay in our State of World Population Report explaining how legal orderly planned migration can make a huge difference for societies. So again, the myths around population can distract us. Yes, we're living longer lives, which you've got to applaud as a good thing. And fertility rates are varying because women have more control, which is also a very good thing. So uh, when you think about life expectancy increasing by almost 10 years over the course uh, uh, since 1990, this is truly remarkable. And then the second main point I just wanted to pull out of the report is to get the right answer, you've got to ask some of the right questions. And we've been asking the wrong questions because the main question isn't too many people in one country, too many uh, here, or too few, if uh, countries are worried about emigration, for example, people, people leaving. The right question is, can everyone exercise their fundamental right to be able to determine, to choose the number and spacing of the children that they would desire? And today I have to tell you that the answer to that question is a resounding no. And it's up to 44% of women who can't even decide who they're going to have sex with tonight, much less can they go to the clinic on their own? Can they use contraception of their own volition? Globally, nearly half of all pregnancies are unintended. And many women, in fact, as we've surveyed, say they, in, in low fertility settings, say they might like to have two or three children, but today they're not willing to do this, and or infertility, which gets scant attention and is actually expensive to treat, uh, limits their ability to fulfill their aspirations in terms of fertility for their family. In one quarter of low and middle income countries, women say they're actually not able to meet their personal fertility aspirations. And UNFPA sees this every day in the 130 countries where we work. We see that young people are still denied very basic information. Standing here in Sweden, I can tell you the difficulties, the pushback, the arguments, and the accusations when UNFPA staff everywhere in the world stands up, as we do, for young people to be able to have factual information about the biology of reproduction, yes, but also about human relationships, which is very protective when we think of a world where gender-based violence is so prevalent. And uh, there are many couples who still cannot access contraception of their choice up until now. The report, uh, and this is my last point, breaks new ground because we report surprisingly that half a million births every year are taking place among girls aged 10 to 14 years old. These are girls so young that they might not even realize they can get pregnant. They're certainly too young to give consent. And some of them are actually already married, married off, abused, coerced, and worse. So until very recently, we weren't even attending to counting this type of young uh, girl birth. Early adolescent pregnancy is most common in Sub-Saharan Africa, where in 2021, there were five births for every thousand girls aged 10 to 14. And the evidence shows that the complex relationship between early marriage, things like female genital mutilation, early pregnancy, unintended pregnancy, curtailment of education is one of the most severe consequences and impediments. And it has a lifelong impact on the girl, but also on the next generation that she's expected to raise literally with her bare hands, right? So I think exercising rights as is laid out in the program of action from Cairo in the International Conference on Population and Development, ICPD, underscores that for development to occur, people-centered development, women-centered development is the best bet. Unfortunately, this is not often the case and rights and choices are not respected. Huge unmet need for contraception, especially again in Africa. 
Globally, the increase in contraception is only just keeping up with population growth. And that means that the absolute number of women who need contraception by the year 2030, when we're looking to the sustainable development goals, will be exactly the same as it was in 2019. And we have to accelerate our ambition, our scope, our reach, our ability to penetrate to the community so the woman can uh, have contraception at her convenience. And these structural conditions have to be addressed. The mythology has to be shattered, but we also have to look for new solutions because there are huge gaps between our aspirations and where we are. And there's also a deep understanding. History warns us about the dangers of treating a woman's reproductive capacity as a tool for those who are in power. The horrors of fertility targets to eugenics, laws on the books in countries today that allow husbands to rape their wife. And over and over, we've seen the power over women's bodies seized by patriarchal structures. The husband, the son, the father, the mother-in-law, whoever, and the state. So the global community has to stand in solidarity and say no to these practices of weaponizing fears about overpopulation or underpopulation to exclude and harm people who may look different or live differently. The world is not going to, to solve the greatest challenges in front of us by looking to fertility rates as the problem because the problem is inequality, deep inequality that is actually increasing. And that inequality is evident in who we count, who we ask, and who we discount, whether or not we think they do count. So let's finally interrogate the numbers as the person that they symbolize. Let us ask questions of population data that show that we're thinking about people. Let us use evidence to avail these 8 billion human souls of opportunities. And when the rights and the dignity and the equal value of all people are truly respected and upheld, that's when we unlock a future of infinite possibilities. So thank you, and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Kanem, for those very strong and important messages. Um, I immediately heard that some of them will probably be uh, moved forward into the panel discussion and also bringing our colleague from Uganda on the screen here in a minute. It is now my pleasure to welcome Helen Edwards, Director General and Head of Department for International Development at the Swedish Ministry of Foreign Affairs. DG Edwards, we are eager to hear more about Sweden's support and priorities and strong support to uh, the rights of young women and SRHR. Please, Helen, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, a particular thanks, of course, to you, Dr. Kanem, my executive director, uh, as well as uh, to the Nordic Africa Institute and everyone else who participates and, uh, of course, contributes to today's event. This is a really important occasion, and I'm uh, particularly grateful to be able to be present when you, Dr. Kanem, present uh, this year's report. Um, it, it is an immensely uh, important topic, and I think that uh, in your presentation, you also highlighted what uh, this particular report actually brings to the table and to the discussions. Uh, and I, I'm really grateful for that. And I think the, uh, the um, the infinite possibilities really catches what this is really all about. And thank you also for um, stressing the takeaways of the report. Uh, firstly, confirming that it does indeed uh, break new ground, but also that the, uh, take, the, the points that you mentioned as major takeaways, the fact that the myths distract us still and that we tend to um, ask the wrong questions. Uh, you also had some really staggering facts in your presentation, which of course remind us of the critical importance of continuing this very, very important work. And I, I really also hope that um, with this report, we will get a, a, a reflection and of course action uh, based on, on what you have uh, unraveled in your report. 
But let me say also, of course, that the government of Sweden fully shares UNFPA's uh, view that population size and fertility rates must be discussed from a rights perspective. We have an obligation to ensure the full enjoyment of human rights by all women and girls. And we, these rights include the right to decide if and when women uh, want to become pregnant and the number of children that women want to have. And you said that 45% of women uh, cannot decide in who they will have sex, say even, which is uh, almost unbearable to think of. And again, reminding us of the importance of uh, this work. Um, a few words on, on the government's overall priorities. Uh, it's uh, been a few months now that uh, uh, there is a new government in power in Sweden. And of course, uh, Sweden remains a very generous provider of development support um, among uh, the top five donors globally. Uh, we are in the, in the process of rolling out an ambitious reform agenda for Sweden's development corporation. Um, there will be some changes made to that uh, uh, development corporation, including uh, on the way we do uh, development aid, uh, focusing more on uh, effectiveness and efficiency and transparency in development corporation. Um, we will also try to uh, make progress on including uh, the private sector. And I think this is also relevant in the area that we're discussing today. How can we bring private sector mobilization into the field of, of health, including on sexual and reproductive health and rights of women and girls? Um, I also mentioned, of course, that uh, the situation in Ukraine after Russia's illegal war is very much in focus uh, for the Swedish government in general, but in particular also for development cooperation. Uh, there is also a strong emphasis on the part of this government uh, to prioritize humanitarian support, uh, climate financing, democracy and human rights still, and uh, poverty reduction health initiatives for the most vulnerable populations. Um, again, as I said, women's and girls' rights. So we will continue to support access to sexual and reproductive services for all including access to modern contraceptives, uh, safe motherhood, comprehensive sexuality education, and safe and legal abortion. Uh, SRHR is also an explicit priority uh, as the theme uh, for this year's report is Africa. I mentioned in particular that we have this as an explicit priority in our cooperation with all partner countries in Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, Africa is the continent with the youngest population in the world, and this group needs healthcare, education and jobs, and for that, sexual and reproductive services and access to those services is really imperative. Uh, we're also very concerned uh, about the persistent opposition against women's, girls and young people and LGBTQI uh, people's enjoyment of SRHR, and of course, lack of enjoyment of SRHR seriously hampers individuals' well-being, health, and survival, as well as sustainable and economic development. Um, of course, as you also uh, have confirmed, SRH services must be of good quality and available and accessible to everyone without discrimination of any kind. And we must also eliminate the legal obstacles that prevent full enjoyment of SRHR. So we share a common, common goal. Uh, all individuals have the right to make decisions about their own bodies and sexuality and that they can access comprehensive care and services that support their rights. This can only be achieved through joint partnerships and uh, efforts and collaboration between governments, obviously, and their agencies, international organizations, the private sector, civil society organizations, researchers and particular practitioners is in that regard key. So UNFPA is doing tremendous work for women's and girls' rights, including by providing access to sexual and reproductive health and rights services. Um, you referred to your presence in approximately 130 countries, including the pushback that many of your field staff is experiencing. I think that is an issue of particular concern, but you can rely on Sweden as a partner to UNFPA. So not least in Africa, and of course, Sweden also remains the top donor to, to UNFPA. So I look forward to our continued close cooperation uh, to promote the full enjoyment of sexual and reproductive health and, and rights for everyone. Uh, again, 8 billion people, uh, as you stated in your report. Many thanks again to the Nordic Africa Institute, UNFPA and RFSU uh, for organizing today's seminar. 
I look forward to listening to the panel uh, and hearing the contributions from participants uh, outside of this room. And just let me end by quoting what you said about uh, accelerating the, the work that we um, that lies ahead of us and, and find new solutions. I could not agree with more. So thank you very much. Thank uh, you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, Director General Helena Edwards, and also again, thank you, Executive Director Kanem, uh, for framing the discussion and contextualizing it. This is, these are important but challenging issues we are discussing here today, so thank you so much. It is now time for me to invite our panelists and lead, who are leading experts and scientists in the field of sexual and reproductive rights. The time we have available is fairly limited, I'm afraid, and therefore we will only be able to scratch the surface of this important topic. But we, of course, hope that the panel discussion will spur further discussions after we leave this room. And I hope, of course, that our online uh, audience would like to engage with us, as well as you in the room, asking questions for the panelists. And you can do that in two different ways, through the Menti app that are shown the, the code is shown on the screen, menti.com. And for you in the room, we will move around with a microphone also to collect questions when we get to the Q&A part of today's seminar. Now, for the sake of time, let me now briefly introduce our panelists. Joining us first from Uganda, and yes, fingers crossed, technology works. <laughs> Dr. Viola. Nila Niakato, an associate of us at the Nordic Africa Institute and a senior lecturer at Mambara University of Science and Technology in southwestern Uganda. Welcome, Viola, and so good to see you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you. In Uppsala. May I please ask our panelists to join me here on stage. First, Hans Linde, one of the co-organizers at FSU, please join me, the chairman of the a Swedish Association for Sexuality Education. Welcome, Hans. And Professor Eleanor Fischer, head of research here at the Nordic Africa Institute. Welcome. Dr. Sarah Thompson, Lead Policy Specialist for Health and SRHR at the Swedish International Development Agency, SIDA. Welcome, Sarah. And Dr. Nafisatu Diop, serving as Chief for Gender and Human Rights at the United Nations Populations Fund. Most welcome. I will move over here so you all have space. Now, I would actually go back to uh, Dr. Kanem's speech, one of the speeches she held about a month ago that I read, where she said that when a girl is forced to drop out of school because of pregnancy, it jeopardizes her health and well being and that of her children, of course, but ultimately her society's prospect or prosperity. I think that's a very strong message. And I'm going to turn to you first, Viola, because I know that this sentence also very much speaks to your um, vision of the future, but also to your research. And earlier this last year, um, actually, it was last year, um, as a visiting scholar here at the Nordic Africa Institute, you wrote a policy note focusing on proposed actions to prevent pregnant girls from school dropout with very solid research evidence from your work in Uganda. And just a week ago, you told me that uh, the children born by teen mothers during the early phases of COVID pandemic are soon ready to start school. Some teen mothers could already have a second or third pregnancy. That's the reality of where you live and work. So Viola, what are your thoughts on this? And how can we in both the global and local community better support these young mothers? Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you 
everyone uh, for a wonderful introduction and uh, making it very important that we discuss these issues. Uh, I will not go into what has already been discussed and presented by the, direct, the executive director for UNFPA and, uh, and um, Edwards. I will focus on Uganda. A few facts. Of course, Uganda is among countries with, um, with the, the youngest population, and everyone could already know that we have an average uh, median age of 16 years for for the average Ugandan, and, and this is um, attributed to, to the fact that Uganda has one of the leading teenage, uh, teenage uh, pregnancies in the region and the highest in, 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 in the world. A recent report by um, the government of Uganda with support from UNSP estimated that the country spent 362 million US dollars on reproductive health care for these girls. And also teenage pregnancy is associated with high maternal mortality and maternal morbidity. I will not go into the details, but as we do this work, teenage pregnancies really increase sexual and gender-based violence, victimization, and failure to complete school. And so my work will really, my presentation is focusing on teenage pregnancy and girls' education. It's also a fact that it, we don't know how uh, teenage pregnancy affects boys' education. So many times we actually look at girls' education and we don't look at how boys have been affected and they continue to be affected. Boys who cause uh, pregnancy to these young girls uh, when they are below the age of consent, they're identified for, criminal, for being criminalized and it also tends to lead to, to school dropout. And um, this, these are the facts that actually motivated my work and my research this year, when I was the last year when I was at the Nomic Africa Institute. And specifically, as already highlighted by the, the executive director of UNFPA, COVID-19 escalated teenage pregnancy. And one of the reports for Forum for Africa Women Education estimated that the teenage pregnancy among the 10 to 14 year olds increased by, increased by uh, 360%. So it's a fact, and the uh, local examples also continue to emphasize this. Overall, in Uganda, teenage pregnancy during the COVID-19 increased by 6%. Why is this important? It, this is because when teenage pregnancy, uh, the acceleration of teenage pregnancy was as a result of school closure, which brought these young girls closer to the sexual and gender-based violence perpetuators around their homes and communities. And these actually included their own parents and relatives and people who are known to them. So people who perpetuate sexual and gender-based violence are actually not strange to these girls. So why we, while the Uganda has attempted and other countries in the region to provide chance for education after pregnancy, it remains on paper and most of these programs and policies that are proposed are punitive and tend to condemn than rehabilitate and provide opportunity. For example, in Uganda, I'll highlight one issue. Um, the country, when they revise their guidelines for school return, they emphasize that these girls should only come back after one year uh, of giving birth and they ch should choose another school, not the school that they were formerly in. And uh, in recently, I was also engaged in one of the of the of, of a countywide uh, study that uh, was media based and covered around forty four thousand respondents, and uh, it em emphasized the study and my research emphasized that uh, a, that shame, blame, lack of child care, ineffective school reentry policies, family and community school tensions. Uh, are hindering these girls from returning to school after pregnancy, and they are continuing to affect our ch uh, chances to promote girls' education and, of course, uh, achievement on gender policy. In the policy note that was launched, that uh, that uh, uh, Teresa has talked about, I recommend that making schools safer for pregnant and parenting adolescents by offering child care support, counseling, and creating awareness campaigns on sexual gender-based violence and gender equality providing secure and ineffective alternative learning environments and removal of community barriers for school return could improve uh, spaces and reduce stigma, shame and blame and early marriages among others, which are continuing to keep these girls out of school. I'm confident and I can assert that to achieve targets for improving adolescent 
adolescent health, gender equality, education will only be achieved through opening spaces for teen mothers. We have talked about these mothers who have not returned to school and should be noted that also when girls go back to school, they are young fathers. The young fathers will also be helped to return to school and prevent intergenerational poverty and school dropout. So that's uh, the point of emphasis that it is possible to reduce, uh, to reduce the barriers to return to school and open space uh, for these young mothers to come back to school. Thank you, over to you, Therese. Thank you so much, Viola, for those strong messages. I know you're very dedicated for these issues and you work closely with different range of stakeholders trying to influence a change on this agenda. So we will come back to you, Viola. Let me turn to you now, Hans, because we're talking about the, the educational mm -hmm. part and your organization advocates for the value of comprehensive sexuality education. At the same time, we hear reports that there is a growing tendency towards mm. social conservatism mm. in Africa, in some and many countries in Africa. How can civil society reach people when there is a growing opposition of SRHR? And what are the lessons learned from your organization in that respect? Mm. Well, thank you so much uh, for that question, Therese. And, and, but I also would like to start by saying, just thanking UNFPA for this excellent report. I think it really underlines an important message for all of us mm -hmm. that this is not a population crisis, but for many women and girls, it's a rights crisis. And I think that's also been underlined by the strong statement by Viola here, that we see how, how many women and girls in all the diversity are right now pushed to the margins of our societies as a result of a combination of structural inequalities and intersecting forms of oppression and discrimination. For them, the reality is we're often little or no choice in their sexual reproductive lives. But from, from our experience working here in Sweden, from the experience of our many partners in Africa, it is obvious that comprehensive sexuality education is a key component if we want to empower women and girls. And we want to ensure that women and girls have the right and the freedom to make informed decisions about their own body, their sexuality, and their health. Um, at the same time, we see that this rights crisis right now is exacerbated by the anti-rights movement, which is undermining rights, spreading myths and fake news, shrinking the space of civil society organizations, and hindering progress. This opposition has become more globalized, interconnected, and strategic, working from the UN to the, uh, to the uh, municipality council level. And we see today an unholy and well-funded alliance of anti-rights movements also mobilizing against comprehensive sexuality education. But I would also like to underline that while we face opposition from conservative religious groups, from populist political leaders, from the extreme rights, we and our partners in Africa very seldom, I would say almost never, face opposition in the classroom from the students and other stakeholders. On the contrary, we see so many inspiring examples of people coming together, standing up for their rights and making a change. I think that the recent process in, in Benin to legalize abortion, it's just such an inspiring example. Um, I would also like to, to emphasize the importance of, of defending the defenders of sexual reproductive rights here the grassroots organizations, the community leaders, and the activists, the teachers, the students who are standing up for comprehensive sexuality education in anti-democratic countries and contexts. For these actors, the concept of shrinking space is not a theoretical concept, it's the reality in their everyday life. Nonetheless, we can see that these defenders play an instrumental role uh, in the fight against the forces that want to restrict people's rights and freedoms. We have seen at the same time in, in, in our work, the importance of digital technology, that this has opened up a multitude of opportunities uh, for realization of sexual reproductive health and rights for all, but also the improved access to comprehensive sexual education. We can see that digital solutions can really be of critical importance for a person that is today not reached by the public health or educational system 
or in a context where law, stigma, and opposition hinders these conversations. We see today example of, examples of how grassroots activists and organizations in countries like Ghana and Kenya are using digital tools in a very innovative way to ensure access to comprehensive sexuality education for marginalized groups. So, and I think this, you know, these examples illustrate the potential in defending the defenders and in using technologies uh, and see how civil society with sometimes, or I would say very often limited resources, but with digital and innovative methods can reach people uh, with imp important information and really make a difference far beyond the reach of the anti-rights movement. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hans. Important, important messaging uh, around the opposition is not in the classroom, for example. Uh, so let's bring that um, forward in the discussion here. Um, I'm going to turn to Nafi, if I, if I may. The UNFP has a vast network um, on the African continent and uh, mostly work with governments, but also a range of different stakeholders. And maybe I can come back to what Hans alluded to in terms of the role of the communities. In the local communities in Africa, both traditional leaders, but also religious leaders have a very influential role when it comes to norms and values and family planning. How does the UNFP work with these stakeholders to promote SRHR? And what are the key lessons learned? If you can share those with us, thank you. Thank you so much for the question. That is a very important question, particularly these days. Mm. Uh, the example of Uganda, thank you. Uh, I just want to say, remind uh, that we um, are facing, you know, uh, and we have currently, uh, in terms of statistics, 200 million women and adolescent girls who do not have access to contraception. We have 12 million girls that have married before the age of 80, so child marriage. We have 4.3 million uh, uh, girls who are subjected to female genital mutilation without, of course, any medical reason per year. We have 145 million missing girls because of gender bias sex selection before even they're born. And I can continue with uh, so many uh, examples and data. So basically what I want to say here is that UNFPA has been uh, able to really focus on three transformative results to make progress in this world. And those transformative results are the ending preventable maternal mortality, ending a need for family planning, and ending gender-based violence and harmful practices. So how can we do that? It's a huge agenda. We can do that only with partnership and strong partnership. And the face-based organization, in addition to civil society, feminist movement, grassroots level, academia, and all the other member states, are key player in that uh, particular area. They have been able to uh, really help us find the language that people can understand. I used to say that the message is important, but the messenger is more important. And the messenger, a faith-based organization, a religious leader who is talking, is, has more credibility than sometimes a civil society organization facilitator or a passionate grassroots woman. So we need to really put it in that context that they are very important. They have been able to help really advance the sexual reproductive health agenda, the HIV agenda, the gender-based violence agenda. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, some of the lessons that we learn, I would just want to give some examples and uh, uh, that's, you know, demonstrate a little bit what we are, are able to do with them. For example, in East Africa, we have been able to have an Africa Action Network of faith-based organization, and they have been instrumental in supporting the bill, East Africa bill on SRHR. That is results. If I 
I take an example of a country uh, like uh, Uganda, for example, the government of Uganda was not supportive of comprehensive sexuality education. And it's a faith-based organization who have been able to push this agenda and ensure that young adolescent women, and, uh, girls, adolescent girls and, and boys will have access to that life-saving type of information and uh, know where they can go to receive services. So I think that we need to uh, really, uh, uh, you know, uh, look a little bit at all those efforts. And I uh, was remind, uh, reminded by the colleagues who is uh, our lead in Ukraine, but before Ukraine, he was in Egypt. He was reminding us this morning that actually, you know, the advancement of the work on the elimination of FGM in Egypt, which is now showing dramatic success with a decrease on the prevalence rate in the younger generation, was instrumental because of Al Azhar University, which is an Islamic, you know, faith based group, and because of the Coptic Church. And definitely, this is, you know, some result that we have seen over the years. So, uh, I do just want to say that in general, UNFPA is really engaging them in several uh, areas. Leadership capacity strengthening of uh, members on advocacy and community mobilization for social norm change. We are engaging them in policy setting. They issue pastoral letters, for example, for their constituency. Uh, strategic planning for sustained action. We are working with them on joint advocacy at the national and district level. Uh, we are uh, supporting them in mobilizing populations, in the, working at the grassroots level, in using the different constituency, the different places where they are, uh, you know, working to really pass that strong message that we are talking about. And let's not forget that they have media houses. And those media are very powerful. So this is what we are, uh, as UNFPA, doing with it. With a lot of key achievements, I mentioned some of them, but there is more on, on uh, you know, different uh, joint declaration, on ending uh, teenage pregnancy, ending FGM. You know, uh, uh, really, you know, sometimes even you know, bringing uh, that um, um, strong. Uh, how I can say that using actually, you know, the the, the, the religion to really ban this kind of practice, you know, and the practitioner and the, the, the people are listening. And I think that in terms of uh, really uh, lessons learned is that, uh, of course, we need to, we have those, this agenda that we are pushing that are very strong. And that is the agenda of women and girls' rights. Uh, but we also know that, you know, uh, human rights of, uh, you know, everybody is important and need to be protected. So probably one of the lessons is that as we continue to work with them in really advancing the, the SRHR agenda that include the GBV and all the different uh, uh, components, we really need to ensure that, you know, the issue of rights for everybody and for all is also understood. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for sharing so many concrete examples. And I want to return to one of the first things you mentioned, find, help find the right language mm -hmm. because reaching uh, the stakeholders is key and whatever road you take. So thank you for bringing that to the discussion. Sweden's International Development Corporation, as we also heard from DG Edwards a few minutes ago, has a long-standing support to civil society working with SRH issues in Africa. And let me turn to you now, Sarah, uh, from your experience as CEDA's lead policy specialist. What are some of the ways that CEDA is promoting the achievement of SRHR on, of young African women? Thank you. Um... CEDA approaches SRHR in much the same way that we do other key challenges, which is that we try to take a holistic uh, approach. And we do this with SRHR by asking two questions. First of all, what do young women need? Uh, 
uh, in order to achieve sexual and reproductive health and rights. And of course, they're included as we are women ourselves. Um, and second, how are these needs and rights then best addressed? So on the first question, what do they need? They tell us they need information. They need access to free or affordable healthcare services of good quality. They need a basic education, including uh, comprehensive sexuality education, social services for the poorest, the most indigent, those whose families can't put food on the table. And here I just want to say a personal story of my own. Uh, when I met girls in Nampula, probably in Natalia, uh, it's, a, it's a northern region in Mozambique where the level of child marriage is 67%. And when, when I asked them why, why I asked the girls, why our children married off here so much? And they tell me, our parents see us as ATMs, mm -hmm. so cash machines. They're poor, people are poor. And when they can marry off their daughter, they can access her husband's funds. So it's it, in that setting, it's not a question of values or norms, yeah. except, you know, girls are seen as expendable, obviously, but it's also a question of survival. So this issue of cash, poverty, social services, including also, I totally agree with you, Viola, and the research also on uh, the, the need for childcare for girls to be able to go back to school. But in also an environment that's conducive to gender equality, mm -hmm. including freedom from sexual and gender-based violence is what girls need. And they need respect for human rights, all human rights, not just a couple of them, including non-discrimination. And they also need to be seen in all of their diversity. Um, a girl living in a refugee camp in northern Uganda has different needs than a married teenager in northern Mozambique. An educated young lesbian in Kinshasa has different needs than an out-of-school working heterosexual teenage girl in Korea. So in other words, SRHR has to be approached from a multi-sectoral and intersectional perspective. So second, how then should these needs be addressed? So CETA's support to SRHR in general, not just for young women in Africa, attempts to contribute to an ecosystem that surrounds the individual, addressing needs and rights from different levels. First, there's systems building. This is where the state comes in. Many people don't know we actually are not allowed to give direct funding to most governments in the countries where we work. So how do we build systems? We work through the UN, such as UNFPA. We work through international NGOs. We work through local NGOs. Um, an example is a Congolese organization called Songhu, uh, who uh, worked to build up uh, midwifery capacity in the DRC. But states and systems also need to be complemented by democratic movements and yes, grassroots organizations that hold governments accountable for the various commitments that they have made, including the Universal Declaration on Human Rights and the Right to Health. And this is best done by supporting civil society and free and independent media. And finally, uh, CEDA supports global, regional, and, and uh, local research organizations um, who have an important role to play in ensuring equity and accessibility of the best medical technologies. An example is the Human Reproductive Program at WHO, which we have been supporting for 50 years uh, and which produced the most recent uh, updated guidelines on safe abortion that every country in the world should follow. And, and happily, UNFPA is helping governments to uh, adapt these to their local situations. Um, so finally, I mean, this is a CETA, and luckily we have a government that, that uh, really uh, prioritizes SRHR because we know that without SRHR, we will never achieve the sustainable development goals. So I'm very proud and happy to be able to work on this issue for CETA, I have to say. Thank you, Sarah. And thank you for bringing in the holistic systems context, uh, because I'm now going to turn to uh, you, Eleanor, um, and ask you to reflect on your almost 30 years of experience. 
of, of conducting research across the African continent, specifically focusing on social equity and gender issues. And building on what you have heard from the other panelists and the speaker here, speakers, how do uh, women's power and agency contribute to development and poverty reduction? And how are they interlinked and connecting to what, for example, Sarah mentioned here? Thank you very much, Joyce. I'm going to also keep my answer rather brief because it would be very nice to have time for questions. Um, we've been hearing how social norms are so embedded within the many examples that we've been given the um, what we do and what other others around us do and what we believe is acceptable to do or not to do and how intractable it can be to change those social norms which has taken the discussions um, into the issue of women's empowerment um, and how development and poverty reduction feed into that empowerment um, and what capacity and agency women have to exercise choices. And we've heard some very stark examples of how women cannot exercise choices. I think I'm just going to make a very simple point here about research. And in fact, it reflects some of the points you make about because we are an agency that focuses on qualitative social science research. And that is the importance of asking people themselves about what their priorities are, mm -hmm. what they need, and not prejudging. We're living in a very polarized world with very stark situations that we've had many examples today, but we shouldn't prejudge what is important to people, what people need, and also what opportunities there are there, perhaps to make changes. I guess you call it something that's demand-led, but when you're confronted by such difficulties, it may also be that there are ways of getting at these very tricky issues circuitously. And you can only at something that maybe some people agree on, that there might be an opportunity there, that through research, you can properly understand women's lives and women's lives within a context where can we make changes? What is possible rather than just seeing the barriers? And for me, the type of research that we do here at the Nordic Africa Institute, qualitative, participatory, understanding where people are coming from themselves and where young African women in the context of this panel discussion are coming from is a starting <laughs> point for that. So I'll hand back to you, keeping it very short. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for bringing us back to one of the messages uh, provided by Dr. Kanem on, on focusing on people, people centered, and what you have emphasized here and look at the possibilities, do not prejudge. I think that's also important messages. Um, I'm cognizant of time. Uh, we're running a bit behind because I think there are so many key messages that have been brought together here now. And I'm actually going to use my power as moderator and uh, see whether we have had any questions through from our online audience and ask my colleague Victoria to say them. Let's bring one and then see if there are questions in the room. Please, Victoria. Thank you very much. So I'm speaking into this green box for the audience. Uh, I'm delighted to be here. Um, I, there is a question that's come in for uh, Dr. Bjork. Uh, do you see any links between sexual and reproductive health and rights and young women's political empowerment? Uh, we actually have another question, but that's also for Dr. Diop. So perhaps we can, uh, I'll Please give it. Her. And then I also yeah. think that my colleague Shay will be able to take questions from the room. So I'll I'll read the other question as well. And it is, um, first, thank you for a powerful talk, Dr. Kanem. And what are the specific ways ahead for UNFPA to address challenges of global setbacks on sexual and reproductive health and rights? Fantastic. Thank you so much. We, uh, let's see if we have a question in the room. 
and my colleague Jay will be moving around with the microphone. And Jay, do you mind? And Adlan, uh, hi, I'm Patience Mosusa, Senior Researcher at the Nordic Africa Institute, and I have a question for my former colleague, uh, Viola, which is, um, what would you advise for researchers conducting research on, social, on sexual and reproductive rights in contexts where there is significant pushback by anti-rights movements? How do you go about engaging? Thank you so much for that question. And I will ask Madame Diop first to respond to the question. You're going to switch on the So please, Madame Diop. Yes, uh, thank you so much. And uh, yes, definitely there is a strong linkage between uh, uh, political leadership and particularly women political leadership and SRHR because we have seen that in a lot of uh, countries and places where we are working, the advancement of SRHR in terms of policy laws, in terms of uh, improvement of services and all. In terms also, I will not talk only about political with you know, the uh, representative, like the MPs and all, but I will talk about also political leadership from grassroots feminist organization. And uh, this is, those are the ones who are really moving the SRHR agenda and actually being also very vocal these days against the pushback that we are seeing in uh, that area. So, uh, but all those need to start with, you know, the, the, the strengthening the education uh, process from what we are doing from in school, out of school, education of women, education of uh, adolescent girls, uh, the comprehensive sexuality education. So all those from different components are quite important when we are, uh, you know, if we want to build uh, that women's and adolescent girls political leadership. Because today at UNFPA, we are talking about the young feminist organization. And this, those are the ones that we really want to bring more on the space and give them the platform to relax because it's quite a different and they have a different perspective and they have more uh, they are more uh, women's rights and rights for all oriented. So given that the space is a, a, a big uh, area for us that we are trying to bring that political leadership uh, to really advance the SRHR agenda. Thank you so much. And I'm going to let the others in if you have any comments. Hans, do you have something you want to add? Perhaps I would like to, to you know, just comment on a question about you know, the political setback, because yes, we see, we have talked already a lot about the pushback we are seeing when it comes to sexual reproductive health and rights. But I think it's so also important for us to recognize all the progress being made at the time, that this is not one trend at the world at the time, there are two different trends. Even in Africa, we see a number of countries that we see right now moving in the right direction. I mentioned you know, the, the process in Benin earlier on with liber liberalizing abortion rights. But I think if we look, for example, at Sierra Leone and how they now invest in midwives, or the progress we have seen in a country like, in, in like Angola when it comes to strengthening the rights of LGBTQI persons, I think that that's, you know, examples, just a few examples of many of progress we see right now, even in Africa. And I think we, you know, we also must see that, you know, in a time of pushback, there's also room for progress when there, are, when there is a political leadership uh, and when there's a room for people to come together, mobilize, organize and raise their voices. Um, so that perhaps, you know, brings me back to my, my, my earlier point that the importance of us defending you know the defenders of sexual reproductive health and rights across the globe excellent thank you so much let me now look at my colleagues so that we can switch on the the sound of our colleague viola about yes. i can't hear can you hear me Yes. I can't hear your question. Yes, okay, that's fine. Uh, thank you very much. And um, I hope I'm audible. I will uh, answer the question that uh, my colleague Patience raised on how do we 
uh, get to, 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 to work on sensitive topics. And I'll share my experience of working on sexual, comprehensive sexuality education. One, on in-school comprehensive sexuality education, when we had a grant with uh, PhD students and, uh, and then it was at a time when the country was banning anything to do with comprehensive sexuality education. At that time, we had already had a community advisory board that had reviewed the tools, the research program, and the research questions. And, and because of, um, and also the purpose of the research, and it was a cross-sectional uh, represent, represent a, 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 a committee advisory board that was representative of the community members, teachers, religious leaders, but also uh, local government officials and central government officials. And it was uh, at the peak in 2015, when it was at the peak when Uganda was actually reviewing uh, the sexual education framework, and there were uh, lots of controversies. But at that time, because uh, um, we had a board, a consultation, a consultative board, we got a clearance for our research to go on. So the PhD students progressed, and the activities in schools progressed, and we continued to work. And recently, we also have been working on parent-child communication uh, and sexual sexual and reproductive health communication, and also working with the community advisory board, but also sharing evidence about uh, what is talked about, what is not talked about, and the consequences of not talking about uh, sexual and reproductive health topics with children by parents. And uh, we use participatory methods and presented uh, in a method that we use World Cafe and a data party. And the parents and the communities engaged with data and evidence that was uh, translated in the, in the local languages and at the end of it all there was buy-in and agreement that and I agree with members that have said that the communities are not opposed but as long as there is trust but also there is preparedness on the side of the researcher that it is your responsibility to ensure that you use methods that are creative in such a way that they allow you to deal with these uh, with these sensitive topics and after that, uh, our call, uh, my students, our colleagues whom I've worked with, our partners have found themselves in churches and in, uh, and uh, we have worked with the Interreligious Council of Uganda. We have worked with, um, with the, 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 the religious institutions and we have been on the table discussing SRH topics that, that, uh, are, that are, are, are agreeable to all of us, but as well as the sensitive topics of contraception.